So for our next session, it was meant to be one of my colleagues, uh, Phoebe Leyland, speaking, but unfortunately, Phoebe was unable to make it today. So I've stepped in and I'm going to be talking on a very, very important topic, as far as I'm concerned. And that's looking at brand mentions versus links and really making PR coverage work harder for SEO. So to kick things off, you've just landed a piece of coverage on one of your dream publications. You're experiencing that massive buzz that comes alongside doing so. But just seconds later, you're feeling massively disappointed and frustrated. <clears throat> the source of that frustration is that you've realized that the coverage you've landed doesn't link to either your or your client's website. Now, to give a bit of context to today's talk, I went into one of our board meetings at the end of last year with a main agenda point of this surge in brand mentions is killing our client KPI targets. Now, as an agency that's predominantly SEO and search led, we are perhaps unsurprisingly KPI on linked coverage, certainly as one of the main metrics that we're tracking. And one of the things that we started to notice over the course of a few months was that we were seeing certainly a noticeable increase in brand mentions. Now, as an SEO, brand mentions are frustrating. I'll get into a bit more of that in a moment, but it needed a discussion. So rather than simply accepting this, we decided to sort of branch out a little further and try and figure out what was really going on here and whether we really were seeing this surge in brand mentions or whether there was something else at play. So, where we started is addressing that the digital PR industry is evolving at a really, really rapid pace. The content types, the formats, the stories, the tactics, what's working today is very, very different to what was working two years ago. Very, very, very different to what was working three or four years ago. I clearly remember sort of 2015, 2016, when we started heavily using content marketing as a way to earn links for clients. We were producing what when we look back now, were pretty embarrassing infographics, but they worked. I will never forget creating an infographic on sleep tips for a bedding client. I think we did um, top 10 sleep tips for entrepreneurs. We rebadged it to sleep tips for students, for busy people, for new mums, with only a few very, very small changes. I think every single infographic that we launched there earned 30 to 40 plus links on the mail, Huffington Post. Those sorts of things worked in 2015. They absolutely don't today. But things move very, very quickly. I'm talking months as opposed to years and sometimes weeks, we can start to see things differing in effectiveness. But one of the things that we really came across is that the number of placements that an average campaign earns is in decline. Step back a few years and campaigns that earned hundreds of links were actually once pretty common. Now they're incredibly rare. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing as the industry's made a shift to focusing on relevancy, on the clickability of links. There's a reason why we're seeing this, but ultimately we have to accept that setting our sights on these sort of mega campaigns that many of us once did just isn't realistic now. So why, why is this? Well. There are more of us doing this than ever before. And of course, when there's more campaigns being pitched, this means there's increased competition. Journalists' inboxes are busier than they ever have been, and it takes something special to cut through the noise. And then we have this issue of what I call copycat campaigns. Now, we've all done them, most Googled, most Instagrammed, most TikToked, Rich List, most popular on Spotify, the sort of campaigns that are in many ways really easy to execute, they're safe, they're safe bets. Now, these campaigns absolutely have their place. Don't get me wrong, we use them, we have done for a while, and I can't see it changing to a certain extent anytime soon. But what we have to remember is that when we come with copycat campaigns, and my sort of definition of that is where we've got two or more agencies or brands launching a very, very, very similar campaign, usually using a similar topic and the same data source. 
And what's happening there is that we're cannibalizing each other's efforts. Rather than us earning, let's say, 20 pieces of link coverage, realistically, each of those campaigns is going to earn half of that. So we're ensuring by doing this, we have to ensure that we're thinking outside of the box and where we can avoiding what I'm classing as copycat campaigns. Really what we know is that journalists want something unique, but we have this challenge that new ideas are getting harder to have. Again, coming back to this point that there are more of us doing this than ever before. And then finally, we get onto this topic of unlinked brand mentions. And my take here is that unlinked brand mentions, they've always been a thing. We've always faced them. But actually, as the number of placements that the average campaign earns, we start to notice these more. When we really notice them is when we're having multiple conversations with clients, with colleagues on, okay, well, actually, we earned a great number of placements, but they didn't all link. And that's exactly where I want to focus our attention today. I want to talk about how you can make PR campaigns and your PR efforts work harder for SEO. And I'm going to dive deep into sort of setting the scene, what the problem is here and how big this issue is. I'm going to talk about what makes a journalist link out in 2021, what you can do to prevent unlinked brand mentions in the first instance, and then look at how you can turn any brand mentions that do come about into links. So, I turned to the last 18 months of our campaign coverage here at Digitaloft. And what I found is that one in four pieces of coverage that we earned from digital PR didn't link. Now, getting a bit more granular, at the peak, that was 37%. One month over a third of the coverage that we earned didn't link to our client's site. Ultimately, that means it's not contributing to their SEO goals in the way that it could be. Yes, on the other end of the scale, that's been as low as 10%, but ultimately, 24% of the coverage we earned over the last 18 months didn't link. As an SEO, this is somewhat of a concern, or at least a challenge that we have to address and overcome. So I wanted to dig deeper into this. So I turned to Twitter, and what we can clearly see is that more businesses and agencies are being measured on links than mentions perhaps comes as no surprise. But what we know is that if brand mentions aren't being counted towards a KPI, then campaigns have to work harder. They have to earn a higher number of placements than ever before to compensate for these unlinked brand mentions. Ultimately, we need a strategy to turn mentions into links. But again, I'm a big believer that to truly understand how we overcome these challenges, we have to understand the full contact. We have to put ourselves in a position where we're able to understand from all angles what's happening and why. So firstly, I wanted to dig into, well, why? Why are businesses, clients, and agencies, why are we all still so focused on links? Well, what we can see is that most businesses and agencies who are running digital PR activity, links are still the number one goal, over 70%. Now, even if we move away from the SEO benefit of links a little bit, yes, links do contribute to that, but we can't forget that links also send referral traffic. Sort of in their raw nature, links are navigational, links send traffic from page A to page B. At least directly, brand mentions don't do this. So perhaps it's no surprise that really what we're all aiming for still, and when I say most of us, over 70% of us, is links. But then when we dig even further deeper into this, I wanted to understand where the budget for digital PR activity is coming from. And again, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's most commonly the SEO budget that's paying digital PR activity. And when it's the SEO budget that's financing this, it's again no surprise that links are the main KPI that success is measured against. We're going to struggle to find an SEO team, an SEO department that is happy to pay 
or, or at least invest when the majority is. Brand mentions. Perception is shifting. We're certainly seeing budgets sort of merge from online and offline teams. But this helps us to understand the challenges that our clients, the in-house teams that we work with, are facing and actually why we shouldn't be having discussions really in terms of why won't this client accept brand mentions, have the conversation with them and understand their goals and what the outcome needed is from their budget and what they're investing with you. But I turned to a number of in-house marketers in my network to understand what they have to say on this issue. So Amy, SEO manager at Manchester Airport Group, gave me a great quote on brand mentions can provide signals to crawlers and give a greater depth of trust and authority. However, the value of a link is much greater, which is why our primary KPIs are often tailed towards link acquisition. We still look to brand mentions in a positive light and a way of measuring success, but links will always be our ultimate goal. Makes sense. SEOs are predominantly still targeting links from digital PR activity. And then Robbie at RVU, another great point that we have to consider. Brand mentions are fine. Homepage links are okay, but top quality links deep into your site from high quality new domains are the pinnacle. So why as an in-house team would we KPI fine and okay when we could spend our budget on delivering the best? We're all aware that budgets have come under so much scrutiny over the past 18 months through the pandemic and in-house teams are having to justify every pound that's being spent. So again, perhaps it's no surprise that the expected outcome is the best that that can deliver. Understanding the challenges that our clients face allows us to work with them to deliver against those goals. And lastly, a different opinion still, Carl Borg, founder at Outforia, moved away a little bit from SEO, saying even ignoring the lack of SEO benefits and implied attribution expectations, mentions are a bad idea from a user perspective. Many times readers want to visit the research mentioned in an article only to find no way to do so, leaving them frustrated. We've all been in this position where we're consuming news, we're consuming content. We want to visit a source, but there's no link. It's frustrating. Comes back to the fact that SEO aside, links are navigational. They help to pinpoint a user from A to B. But again, there's two sides to every story. And I wanted to follow this up by reaching out to a series of journalists. So last month, I spoke to over 50 journalists to ask what encourages them to link out from their articles. And interestingly, I first asked when covering a PR campaign, do you link to a business's website? Only 51% of journalists will always link out to external sources as standard. This means we're fighting an uphill battle as soon as we pitch in. Half of the journalists we're pitching into aren't necessarily going to link, even if they cover the story. Expanding on this a little bit, I asked which of the following statements can you relate to the most? Perhaps unsurprisingly, 10% say we have a no external links policy. 8% we charge a sponsorship fee. 27% always link out. Thank you to those journalists. They're sort of the holy grail that we love to get coverage from. But 53%, over half, will link out when it adds editorial value. What we can take from this is that if we want to earn links, your content must add editorial value. Really, what's that? It's something extra on the other end of the link. So I wanted some tips, some advice from journalists. So I asked these journalists, what's the number one tip you would give to PRs to help get their content linked to and avoid brand mentions. So the first response that struck me here was as a journal, I wouldn't be doing my job if a link to further external content was needed. As a branded content creator, this is infuriating, the endless conundrum. We have to accept that some publications have a no external link policy, that some journalists don't believe they should be citing their sources with a link. As PRs, we can't change that. We have to accept, at least to a certain extent, that we are always going to face some level of brand mentions. And that's fine. We just have to think about, okay, how can we position this campaign and how can we ensure that we are maximizing those? But accepting it happens and not letting ourselves get too frustrated is ultimately step one here. So another 
tip from a journalist, including your website with their press releases. You'd be surprised how many don'ts I have to go searching. Perhaps in digital PR, this comes as a bit of a surprise. It doesn't really make sense. But we have a journalist here in 2021 sharing that so many PRs, I'm assuming here it's more traditional PRs, aren't including a website address in a press release or pitch. If we want a link, we have to make sure it's clear where we want linking to. Another one here is we almost never link to outside sites. The only instances in which we do is when those sites have information that we think is useful to consumers and that it's not possible to cover in the story itself. For example, if they have a useful tool. This is editorial value, something extra on the other end of the link that can't be covered in the story itself. We have to get into this mindset of editorial value. And when we're able to do so, we put ourselves in a really, really great position to be earning links, not just brand mentions. I usually link out when it's crediting an original piece of research that has been conducted by a business. But if it's a generic link to plug the brand, this is considered advertorial and would fall into sponsored content. We have to really think carefully when ideating, when putting campaigns together and asking, what are we really asking a journalist to link to? And what's the purpose? If it is value adding, then great. But if really all we're, want, or all we're trying to land or wanting is a link to the homepage, to some extent that's advertorial. A journalist isn't there to advertise our business, our client's business. They're there to tell great stories to their audience. Understanding these challenges can help us to work in a way and adopt that mindset that allows us to ensure that a link is a key part of coverage. Again here, possibly one of the ones that got me thinking maybe slightly differently to how I had before, there has to be added value to linking out. Why? Because it takes our readers away from our own sites. When a journalist links out, they're sending their traffic to you. And what we have to ensure is that there's a damn good reason for them to do that. If there's nothing worth linking to, why would a journalist divert traffic away from themselves? Again, another comment that backs this up, an outlet will lose visitors by linking out. So you have to make the landing page so valuable that it's worth losing on the swings to gain on the roundabouts, i.e. thoughtful original content that you haven't sold elsewhere. So looking more at the, almost the concept that if we do land brand mentions, why? I think there's sometimes this misconception that journalists sometimes actively don't link. And whilst I think that's true to some extent, what we can see here is that to be completely honest, I might not always link initially if working at speed, but whenever a PR emails and politely asks for a link, I'm always more than happy to oblige. If we do land brand mentions, there's no harm in asking. And what I'm gonna share in a few moments is a bit of a methodology and a step-by-step -step process to help us turn those brand mentions into links. And again, another here, ask. I think a lot of non-SEOs don't really appreciate the value that a link gives to the creator. Sometimes in the digital PR and SEO world, we operate inside a bit of a bubble. I think we're all guilty of that. And that we don't always stop to think that Journalists aren't in our sector. They're journalists, they're content creators. They're not on the PR or SEO side of the equation. So ask and educate. Ensure that a journalist understands that actually you want to be credited with that link. And again, don't be afraid to open this dialogue with journalists. And again, ensure that you specify where to link to and why it's an appropriate link. We shouldn't be afraid of asking for links in our pitches, in our pitch emails. And then from there, make sure that there are specific resources that add value and depth to any article based on the campaign. Links to a business's homepage or generic topic page are a waste of everybody's time. Think carefully about how we're setting our campaigns up for success here and what that added value is. And then lastly, what frustrates me is if I link to them and then one of their pages, but they want a certain product linked instead. They send me numerous emails. The most I've had is 25, asking for it to be changed to a product. This is unfair as we have linked to them already and will not promote a product that doesn't relate to the story or research. 
in many cases, we shouldn't be reaching out and trying to get links changed if we already landed that link. There's probably a reason why a journalist has chosen to link to where they have. But then what we have to remember is that the process of avoiding brand mentions starts in ideation. We have to set our campaigns up for success from day one on this. And when we go into ideation, what we have to be asking is, how are you going to add editorial value? We have to think about this at ideation stage, otherwise we could get too far down the line into a campaign without really addressing this really, really important concept. So how can we add editorial value? Well, for starters, stop relying on press releases. You have to have something worth linking to. Linkable assets are more important than ever. And some of the options we have here, create a tool or an interactive asset that users can engage with. We can work multiple stories and angles into your campaign content, or you could do a deep dive into data and include an analysis from your experts. Really thinking about how you can add more to a campaign page, an asset, a guide, than a journalist will or is going to cover in their article. And lastly, when you're working on sort of reactive newsjacking content, which so many of us are right now, publish a blog or a guide alongside that. When you're able to do so, ultimately that's gonna go into far more depth. Sometimes it's a case of updating existing guide content, existing blog content, but when you have that asset that adds so much more depth to a comment, you're going to maximize the links earned. And then when it comes to asking for links, if you end up landing brand mentions, what our data shows is that the faster you ask for a link, the higher your chance of success. And what we see here is that if we're able to reach out on the same day as an article was published, the chance of turning that brand mention into a link doubles. But before you go and send that outreach email, I want you to stop and think and ask yourself, who would this link benefit? Is this link going to benefit only you and your SEO team? Or is this link also gonna benefit the reader? If it is going to benefit the reader, you have a really, really good opportunity to turn that brand mention into a link. You have to make it about your audience. And when you're able to make it about the audience, you're going to massively, massively increase your chances of turning that brand mention into a link. And really the way we can think about this is that turning brand mentions into links, it's all about justifying why. You have to be able to demonstrate that editorial value that a link would add to an article. Here at Digitaloft, we take a three-tiered strategy for reaching out to a publication. And we start by going straight back to the journalist that originally covered the story. If we're unsuccessful there, we will reach out to the editor, and again, if we see no traction there, we will go to the corrections desk of the publication. If you're not familiar with the concept of a corrections desk, many top tier publications now have a dedicated email that corrections and clarifications can be sent into. We've used this effectively as sort of a, a last attempt if the previous two attempts have been unsuccessful. And we find this actually has a pretty good success rate. Hunt out the corrections desks and send your requests into these as well. But when it comes to sending these requests, you have to make it as easy as possible for whoever you reach out to, to add that link. And what we know is that your email request should be polite, simple, and straight to the point. Here's the email that we use on a daily basis to successfully turn mentions into links, and we'll be sharing the deck afterwards, which will include this. But to break this down, we start with a clear intro. Ultimately, what are we asking? What's it referencing in terms of the article, the publication? And then we say thank you. Thank yous cost nothing, but they go so far to showing that we appreciate the coverage, not just the link. We then have to show this editorial value. We have to demonstrate what this editorial value is. And then we have to be in a position to include the links for easy reference. Don't make somebody work and have to think about actually where should they be linking, where shouldn't they be linking. We should be including these and making it so easy just to click through to the links in question. So really when it comes to top tips for asking a publication to turn a mention into a link, 
the faster you reach out, the higher your chance of being successful. You have to communicate the editorial value that a link would add and make sure you clearly indicate which article you're referencing and include a link. And then highlight where you want that link to point to. We keep hearing this time and time again when we talk to journalists. Don't make someone have to figure it out for themselves. They probably won't bother. So to wrap up from me, I also wanted to share some examples of some of the most annoying PR practices and errors seen by journalists. Again, when I was chatting to journalists last month, I asked them to share some of the examples of bad practices that they're seeing at the moment. So the first one here, don't insist on us putting in a link to general homepages. We're under constant pressure to make sure that editorial doesn't look like advertorial in disguise. Links are suspicious for readers because they think they're reading a thinly veiled advert there because money has changed hands. When we understand the challenges that journalists, editors and publications face, we can think in the same way as them and we can set our campaigns up to align with this. Again, another here and one that I don't think many in PR are going to be guilty of, but it certainly happens on the SEO side of the industry. We often get emails asking us to shoehorn a brand into an existing article. Never going to happen. You might get traction on some bloggers, on guides, on resource content, but journalists and top tier publications aren't adding links into previous articles, at least when the brand isn't originally mentioned. So here again, it comes back to the quality of the content. If you want us to cover your story, it absolutely has to tell us something new or shocking. We're not gonna cover something that's been done a hundred times before. Comes back to my point on copycat campaigns, copycat concepts, and really thinking about how we can set our campaigns up to be a little different. And then one on sort of turning brand mentions into links, writing snotty notes demanding a link makes it highly likely we'll ignore releases from that person in the future. Don't burn bridges. Yes, we want those links as PRs. Yes, as SEOs, they are so incredibly valuable. But if a journalist doesn't link, we have to respect their decision. Otherwise, we risk setting ourselves up for problems in the future. And that might not just be on that individual client or that individual PR. We've seen this where a whole agency can almost be blacklisted from a journalist or a publication because of bad practices seen like this. Again, sending up follow emails relentlessly. If a journalist isn't responding, it mostly means he or she doesn't want to cover it. Again, yes, we send follow-ups, usually probably two rounds of follow-ups. Don't go overboard. I've heard instances before of emails followed up five, six, seven times. It is overkill. If a journalist hasn't responded in one or two follow-ups, they're probably never going to. So again, easily the most annoying thing is getting PR people contacting to ask we change links in a story to a campaign instead of a homepage. This is becoming more and more widespread and is a waste of our time. We never change the link. Yes, this is going to differ on a publication by publication basis, but if we understand these challenges, we can really start to think what we should and shouldn't be doing. And then lastly, this one really resonated with me. I received an email from a PR recently who said we had an error in our story. We didn't. We just didn't link to their campaign page. We linked to their client's homepage. The PR email, literally everyone in our company they used every email they could find to send it to the same message saying we had an error. All day, I got emails sent to me from people in the US, in Australia, saying there is an error in a story you published. This just meant we will never report on anything on their clients again. Comes back to this thing on burning bridges. As PRs, we should be working with journalists. And if we're essentially bombarding other people saying a journalist has made an error, they haven't made an error. They've chosen not to link, or in this instance, they've linked to somewhere that the PR didn't want them to. Be grateful of that link, appreciate it. I can guarantee you it's better to have a link to a homepage rather than no link at all. To wrap up from me, as PRs, we need to work with journalists. We need to understand their ways of working and understand their own challenges. I can guarantee that working together, having conversations with journalists to understand if we want links, how, how can we do that? How can we set ourselves up for that? 
we will get further doing that than either ignoring them. We should absolutely be following up on brand mentions to try and turn them into links, but neither should we be spamming and bombarding journalists with Certainly what I've seen referenced as sort of sometimes passive aggressive emails, if a journalist doesn't link, we have to find a way to justify that that link adds value. So thank you very much. I'm hoping we have a couple of minutes for questions. I've seen a few come in. Um, so question here is, is there a way to find unlinked brand mentions on the internet? So yeah, there's a few ways to do this. So I think the first one we do is we're always looking for coverage. When we're in sort of active outreach on a campaign, we're straight away going down the route of looking for, we're looking for coverage live, looking to use um, Google News to find coverage almost as soon as it goes live. Um, but aside from that, um, SEMrush has a, a brand mention tool. And again, there, you know, there's other tools like that that we can use. Mentions.com is another great one that we can do. So, we are now on lunchtime. Um, there are a few more questions here, um, which I will be more than happy to address on Twitter. Please feel free to tweet at me. I'll try and tweet out uh, a thread with some points to this as well. We will be back in an hour's time. We'll be back at 2 p.m. when we've got a really, really great afternoon of some more sessions. Uh, in the meantime, go and have some lunch, go and have a break, grab a coffee. We will see you back here in an hour's time. Uh, when we've got Laura from Verve Search, we've got Beth Nunnington, uh, we've got a panel discussion, and we've got uh, Christine from Fractal with some really, really great sessions. So I'll see you all back here in an hour. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day and really look forward to seeing you back here this afternoon. Thank you.